So you're welcome then to the first kind of proper, if you like, lecture that we're going to be assessed on. Um, <clears throat> what I'm going to do is outline an evolutionary argument for crime, or at least some types of crime. Um, you know, you might not like all of the argument, you might not agree with the argument, but I would ask, you know, listen to it with an open mind, and then in the end, we can evaluate it objectively. But I'm going to be trying to argue through the lens of an evolutionary theorist, okay? Um, there's some caveats that come with what I'm saying with this evolutionary approach. Um, first of all, it doesn't excuse behavior, obviously, right? Like what I'm talking about, for example, is some evolutionary based desire or instinct, okay? Then, you know, we're all conscious, rational beings, okay? We can choose to listen to those instincts or not. So if, for example, I'm, you know, talking about an evolutionary argument over why a man commits rape, right? At the core of that, there might be some, you know, deep-rooted desire to pass on their genes, okay? But that's not saying, well, that's just the way it is, right? Obviously, the person is still responsible um, for those actions. The second point to make is that none of this negates other perspectives on it, right? Like a cognitive perspective, for example. Like I say, we're all rational, conscious beings. So we come up with explanations for our behavior. We make sense of the world that we live in. Okay, we come up with justifications and so on. And so two things could be true at the same time, right? Going back to the example I gave, you know, maybe one has a conscious explanation for why they're doing what they're doing. You know, maybe you know, some resentment against women or some other conscious reason. But that doesn't mean that they could also, at a deeper level, be an evolutionary explanation for why they're doing what it is that they're doing. <clears throat> Um, or in you know, the case of committing theft, for example, right? Again, there's likely going to be some post hoc explanation, some conscious level rationalization. But there could also be a kind of deep rooted desire because of evolution to amass resources or to make sure that one has status and wealth and so on. Okay? The two things could also still be true. <clears throat> now, at the core of this argument, we're really looking at the premise. Of Richard Dawkins's book, The Selfish Gene, first published in 1976, okay, which is really arguing that you know people are basically ruthless gene machines, okay, doing what they need to do to make sure that their genes survive, okay. Now this kind of framework might make people out to be kind of mindless, okay, but you know, it's the genes that live on, okay. The individual will eventually die, okay. Um, it's the genes that will pass if one reproduces okay, to the next generation and potentially for thousands of years, right? And yes, there's you know, changes and improvements to the gene from one generation to the next, but it's essentially still the same gene, okay, that's living on. Okay. So in, in this lens, okay, genes are doing what they need to do ruthlessly, okay, to survive. Um, and human beings are basically just containers, okay, for these genes, okay, until they eventually then pass on to the next generation. Now, the behaviors that these translate into are behaviors that, from an evolutionary point of view, have aided in our survival as a species, okay, that have aided in reproductive fitness, okay. And when I say reproductive fitness, you know, the only criterion for success in the eye of the gene, okay, is reproducing. Okay, so living to an age in which one can reproduce and then making sure that, you know, their offspring um, have good chances to also live to a good age and also reproduce. <clears throat> you can see many examples in the animal kingdom of selfishness paying off, right? Um, the female prey mantis, right? Eats the male during sex because it makes sure that she has the nutrients, okay, to pass on to the offspring to make sure the offspring survives. Um, black headed gulls often nest together, okay, but if one mother takes their eye off their offspring, another mother will eat it, okay, because what they're concentrated on is having the strength and nutrients to look after their own offspring, not the offspring of the neighbors. And then if you're an emperor penguin, you know. You have a kind of 
tricky situation because underneath the water, there might be a predator waiting for you. Okay? So if you're not brave enough to jump in yourself, there's kind of two options available to the emperor penguin. You can wait for another brave penguin to jump in and test the waters. Did you get eaten by a predator or is it safe to go in? Or you can volunteer a fellow penguin okay, and have them test the waters for you. Now, in actuality, there's some recent um, critique over this that maybe emperor penguins don't actually do this, but it's a myth. But the gift was too good, so I included it. <laughs> it may or may not be an example. Um, but kind of, you know, in combat to this, there's also examples, right, of self-sacrifice, especially to protect one's offspring. If you've seen the documentary March of the Pi March of the Penguins, if you haven't, I recommend it. It's really good. But you know, what we see in this is the the, the large, large journey that um, the penguins go on. They make sure that their offspring will have the best chance to survive, that they'll be in the best place to survive, and the real struggle that they go through, okay, for their offspring. And in some animals, in some species, you know, one sacrifices themselves, not just for their own offspring directly, okay, but you know, for the, the colony, for example, in honeybees, right, they will sometimes stab or, you know, um, sting attackers, um, knowing that it costs them their death, right, but they're not doing it because they're looking after their own direct offspring, but because they're concerned for the greater colony or to protect the queen. Um, and, you know, in some cases, maybe even self-sacrificing to help another species also could be kind of beneficial, right? We could see this kind of reciprocal altruism in some species as well, right? You know, cleaner fish, smaller fish that clean bigger fish, but of course they're eating the algae and so on, and so they're getting fed. Um, and alarm calls, you know, sometimes when an animal in the, in the wild sees a predator, it makes some kind of alarm call that gives warning to other nearby animals that will then know to leave the scene. Um, you know, this might even be to the detriment of their own survival, right, because they might be drawing more attention to themselves. Um, now, certainly this can help nearby kin, okay, but also actually helps other species as well, right, because you know, deers, for example, learn to pick up on the alarm calls of birds and so on, okay? So it's kind of like a ripple effect once one goes on. <clears throat> so applying this then to criminal behavior, what I'm going to do is, through an evolutionary lens, try to make sense of some, you know, really quite big questions. Why is it that you're 100 times more likely to be killed on the day you're born than any other day of your life? Why is it that you're 50 times more likely to be killed by a step parent than a biological parent? Why is it that some men rape their wives? Why is it that some biological parents kill their children? These are some of the kind of big questions to do with criminal behavior that I'm going to put forward an evolutionary answer for. Um, of course, at the core of this argument is that one is selfishly doing what they need to do in order to get resources, to increase status and dominance, okay? Doing what they need to do to improve reproductive fitness, okay? To make sure that they um, have the best chances of um, passing on their genes, okay, for the next generation. And this might be resorting to theft, okay, so stealing from others, and it might in some cases also be resorting to rape, okay, and so passing on genes this way. Certainly most crimes are to do with gaining power, dominance over others, higher status, gaining resources, okay? And obviously, you know, in the game of reproductive fitness, resources are key, right? If we look back in our evolutionary history, right, resources were key, right? Women needed resources to make sure that they could feed the offspring and so make sure that offspring survives. The males needed resources to make sure that they could help attract a female mate and show that they are able to provide, okay, and maybe also to help um, fight off competitors. And, you know, if we look back even at ourselves quite, you know, early in our development, you know, children are pretty egocentric, right? Freud would say working or operating on their id, right? What they want when they want it. 
one is, you know, has a pretty narrow view, pretty selfish, not really looking at consequences, not really considering others. But you're eventually socialized, right? You realize that, you know, just focusing on you isn't actually the best way to get by in society, right? Because this is a society that's kind of built around reciprocal altruism, right? There's a kind of social contract and so on. People have to, you know, give a little okay, in order to take a little. Um, and so this, of course, helps in our building of empathy and so on, okay? But it's through socialization okay, that one begins to understand that you have to kind of consider others, not just yourself, in order to make it in the society that we have. But for psychopaths, we could describe them really as the ultimate cheats, right? The ones who are not socialized, the ones who never really begin to develop the idea that they have to consider others. They remain on, in this kind of egocentric worldview of only really focusing on themselves. Now, I'm going to come back to that. Um, in relation to how this might tie in with reproductive um, strategies, okay? So, if we're looking at the kind of strategies that there are for passing on your kind of genetic makeup, the options are more limited for women, right? Because they have to carry the offspring for nine months and then the survival of the offspring really determine, really requires that there's going to be very close proximity to the mother for the early stages of development. Um, for men, there's really two main options available, right? Um, in order to make sure that they can pass on their genes. The first option is to put all of your eggs in one basket, if you like, okay? So to kind of settle down with one partner, okay? And then to help in the, um, the parenting of that offspring, okay? To make sure that that offspring has all the resources that they need and the best chances possible to survive. Um, the other strategy is basically the opposite, right? It's putting your eggs in multiple baskets, right? It's not really sticking around, you're not really helping with the parenting of the offspring, okay? But by chance, if you're, you know, um, putting your eggs in enough baskets, then, you know, hopefully by chance, some of those children will still get to reproductive age and still pass on their genes as well. So that's kind of the two um, strategies available. But the second, uh, the second, the latter strategy there really requires the male to misrepresent himself, right? To convince the female that he's actually in this for the long haul, okay? that he is actually going to help look after the child once the child is born. So this would require some cunning manipulation, which are key components of psychopathy, right? The psychopathy checklist is the best measurement that we have for measuring psychopathy, okay? manipulative behavior, pathological lying, cunning behavior, right? These are all key characteristics in the psychopathic checklist. Furthermore, this overall strategy of selfish cheating and taking advantage of the, the altruists in society only works so long as the psychopaths are the minority and the reciprocal altruists are the majority, right? That, that's the only way that strategy will work. And indeed, the psychopaths are the minority in society, right? They make up about 1% of the population. Furthermore, it kind of requires the psychopath to misrepresent themselves, yes, to be cunning and manipulative, but also to be quite willing to move from one location to the other, okay? So that once they're found out, they can kind of then restart their image somewhere else, okay? And indeed, the kind of nomad lifestyle is also a key component to psychopathy in the psychopathic checklist, right? This constant stimulation seeking, this constant changing of jobs and location, never really being happy with where you are, okay, are also key characteristics of psychopathy. So when we look at Crime through this evolutionary lens, right? It's kind of giving us maybe a deeper level of insight, right? And some behaviors that don't really make sense on the surface, okay? Actually, once you dig a bit deeper, you maybe get some insight into, right? The mugger, for example, who beats someone up on the street for what's in the wallet, <coughs> isn't really getting much further effort, okay? But this 
kind of thieving strategy in the long term, okay, might be a successful way of getting one's resources. Um, a drive-by shooting, you know, would seem senseless and without reason, okay, but if it's helping improve status and dominance, okay, for that individual within their group and also maybe over competitors or rivals, okay, and, you know, maybe a bar fight, okay, that stems from an argument over pool, okay, seems pretty kind of pointless, okay, but actually, of course, if it's really about dominance over one, okay, the fight has nothing to do really with pool, okay, it's actually something kind of much deeper than that. <coughs> We can make a comparison between different societies, see which might give rise, okay, to some antisocial traits, at least more or less so than others. And one way of doing that, for example, would be a comparison between those in the Amazon and then some Kong Bushmen. Okay. So for the Kong Bushmen, life is hard, right? It's a very, very harsh climate. Food is hard to come by, okay? And because food is so hard to come by, even if you are the most skilled hunter, there are still going to be days in which you come back empty-handed, okay? And what we find in these sorts of communities is that there is high agreeableness, high cooperation, high altruism, and high empathy, okay? That the societies really do work together and look out for each other, okay? And this reciprocal altruism is necessary, really, for the survival, right? Because even if you're a skilled hunter, there's still going to be days when you go hungry unless you can rely upon others, okay? So you act charitable to someone and then they act charitable to you another day, okay? And so by sharing in this community, that's the best way to ensure survival. If we compare this to, for example, the Amazon, where food is plentiful, okay? and if you're a skilled hunter, you'll always get food, okay? What we see is much lower rates of agreeableness and cooperation. You don't see the same kind of reciprocal altruism at the core of the community, okay? Instead, it's more about aggressive um, competition, okay? Individualism, okay? Because so long as you are the most skilled, okay, you'll always be successful, okay? And so the emphasis is you being on, you developing your skills as much as possible and you being the best successful individual. Along these lines, there's a text uh, by Chagrin from 88, um, in which he writes about his observations um, when um, living with natives in South America, um, particularly the Yanomamo in Venezuela. Um, and, and what he outlines really is two main communities of the Yanomamo. Um, there's a group who live in the highlands in Venezuela, okay, where food is pretty hard to come by. Um, and where they are, again, very agreeable, cooperative, clear signs of reciprocal altruism, okay, hunting together, working together, feeding each other. And then in the lowlands, where food is far more plentiful, there's this um, emphasis on competition, okay, much higher rates of aggression, violence, much lower rates of reciprocal altruism and cooperation. So in the lowlands, um, in, uh, in Venezuela when studying the Yanomano. Um, the text outlines a number of examples of antisocial features, um, breaking rules when it's in self-interest. Um, the women are taken by force, okay? They have no say in who their husbands are going to be. Um, a, a great degree of aggressive behavior, fearless um, characteristics. 44% of those over 25 have killed another man. And 30% of all male deaths are due to violence, okay, from, a, from another man. Those who have killed, so this 44%, okay, um, who have this term, you know, guys, there's a difference between them and the men who have not killed, okay? Um, on average, those who have killed have 1.6 whites in comparison to 0.6 of those who haven't killed, okay? And on average, they have 4.9 children in comparison to those who haven't killed, we have about 1.6 children. Okay. So in this sort of scenario, okay, the violence is reaping rewards, okay, at least in the lens of reproductive fitness, right? It's increasing the resources that we have, 
also those that attack other villages or attack themselves less frequently, okay, then proving, uh, proving dominance over others, okay, is one way of protecting yourself, protecting your own resources, protecting your offspring, okay. <clears throat> now, you may think, well, you know, in our society, you know, this kind of evolutionary propensity for aggression and violence is no longer relevant, right? It's only something that's maladaptive. Okay? Uh, what I'm going to argue um, in this lecture is in some cases, okay, I'm going to talk through some specific cases of crimes, it, it may still be actually adaptive from an evolutionary point of view. Okay? I'm not going to explain all crime, okay, but at least partially it's going to give us some insight. Um, and then you might also think, you know, are we really as removed as we think from this kind of, you know, aggressive um, interest, aggressive desire, right? Um, I mean, in the Western world, you know, yes, people aren't, you know, attacking other villages and so on, but, you know, we still reward soldiers when they come back from war, maybe after having killed, we make popular violent sports, like boxing, even though we know it causes brain damage. We love violent movies, like action thrillers, in which we watch, you know, the hero beat the, the, living, uh, the living daylights out of the bad guys, right? Are we not getting some, you know, vicarious thrill through this, right? Um, and then we could go, you know, more extreme as well, you know, why is it that there's such a fascination with true crime, right, from podcasts to movies to books, right? Why is it that when male serial killers are convicted, they get fan mail from hundreds of women across the US who seem to be pretty peaceful, law-abiding citizens. Um, why is it you all took this course, right? You all gave me pretty nice-sounding answers last time, but maybe that's just your rationalization. Maybe, you know, there's a deeper, morbid fascination with violence under the surface. <laughs> So if we're arguing that maybe evolution can help explain, for example, homicides, um, one kind of counterpoint to that would be the number of um, homicides that occur within the home. Okay? Obviously, it's not to the benefit of the species, right, or even your own genes, okay, if you're killing those you're genetically related to. But actually, what we find is that most homicides are to do with unrelated people. Okay, 10% of murders are husbands killing their wives. Okay, who, well, at least in most cases, are not you know, genetically related. Um, and actually, less than 2% of homicide victims are blood relatives okay, to the perpetrator. Um, Non-related residents, 11 times more likely to kill than um, the residents that they're genetically related to. And I'm going to come back to this, but the most common motivation for men killing their wives is um, sexual jealousy, okay? <clears throat> um, maybe also giving some insights into certain homicide cases, looking maybe at the role of step-parents. You know, step-parents you know, get a pretty, pretty bad rap, right, in fiction. I'm sure you all know the story of Hansel and Gretel um, abandoned in the woods because their father was convinced by their, by, by their stepmother to leave them there. Um, Cinderella and the wicked stepmother and stepsisters, right? Or um, Snow White, right? The stepmother, the evil queen, got a huntsman to kill her in the forest. Um, but actually, what we find is um, step parents are six times more likely to abuse children who are under two than biological parents are. <coughs> now, obviously, the vast majority of step parents, right, are loving individuals who care for the children they're looking after, okay? Um, what we're talking about here is a significant minority. But in England, for example, only 1% of babies live with a step parent. Yet, 53% of baby deaths or baby killings are due to a step parent. Okay. Um, in the US, a step parent is 100 times more likely to 
abuse and kill the child okay, than a biological parent. Now, from an evolutionary perspective, this would, or the, the argument would be that if you're looking after children, some of which are genetically yours and some of which are not genetically yours, you want to minimize the resources going to the children who are not genetically similar to you and maximize the resources going to the children who are genetically similar to you. Because okay? that's the best way of ensuring that your genes live on, okay, and that you're not you know, helping raise someone else's genes and helping them pass on at the kind of detriment to your own offspring, biological offspring. Um, but then why is it that some even biological parents kill their, ch kill their children? You know, evolutionary arguments can give us some insight into this as well. Um, first of all, younger children are far more likely to be killed by a biological parent than an older child. Okay. Why might that be? Well, from an evolutionary point of view, you already have a child who you put a lot of effort into and who is near the point of reproductive age. And it makes sense to focus mostly on that individual, okay, because they already have a good chance of getting to reproductive age. Whereas if there's a massive change in circumstances, you know, maybe a financial crisis, or maybe the younger child has some medical condition, okay, that, you know, through this kind of old way of looking at it, might be sapping resources from the older child, right? It might make sense if you don't have the resources to spread the butter too thinly, right, to put the attention onto the older child, okay, and sacrifice the younger child. Um, furthermore, younger mothers, mainly in their young 20s, are more likely to kill their biological children than older mothers, okay? Now, from an evolutionary perspective, also, we can make sense of that, okay? For example, some birds raise their offspring together, okay? And if something happens to one of the parents, then the other bird abandons the children and starts over again with another partner, okay? Because statistically, they have a better chance of helping raise those new children by starting over again with another partner, okay? Rather than single-handedly um, looking after the um, initial offspring. So, applying this to what I just said about younger mothers being more likely to kill their children than older mothers, Okay, that kind of strategy would only make sense if one has, you know, enough time to find another partner, okay, still at reproductive age, okay, and then has the time also to raise those offspring. So for the younger mother, right, that might make the most sense, okay, they have the, um, the time, they have the probability on their side that they could start over again, which might not be in the cards for a older mother who might then think that they should stick with the cards that they have. So this is an illustration of what I said. Okay, so what we have here um, is the number of um, children killed by a biological mother. And you can see overwhelmingly, it's more likely to happen in the first year of life. Okay, and then increasingly so as one gets older, pretty much zero chance after 14 years of age. Now, one counter argument you might have, especially if you've taken my forensic psych course, might be that, you know, maybe during this year, the mother is suffering from mental illness, right? Um, Postmortem depression or psychosis, which sometimes includes suicidal fantasies, homicidal ideas. Um, but if that was true, we wouldn't find, or, or if that was explaining all of the data, we wouldn't find the exact same finding with fathers, right? Fathers haven't given birth, obviously, so they're not, you know, experiencing the same change in hormones and the same um, impact on their mental health that women do in the first year. Um, and yet we find the same pattern, okay, that by far they're more likely to kill their biological children in the first year um, than later in the child's life. That alone can't be explaining all of the data. Now you might argue that maybe partly this is because, you know, children are really irritating in the first year, they cry non-stop and maybe the children the parents rather act out because of this. Um, but actually when parents are surveyed, they say that the teenage years were the most stressful years. Okay, This was the years in which the children were arguing back and fighting back. These were the most stressful. These were when the 
parents were more likely to lose their patience. This is when the parents were more likely to feel kind of aggravated and angry towards their child. Um, so that also can't be explaining um, why it is that you're so much more likely to be killed in the first year than um, later on. Okay, and then what about explaining rape? Obviously, at the core of this is just that the man is trying to pass on his genes, okay, and he's resorting to rape, maybe because he doesn't see other avenues available to him. Um, in support of this, rapists are typically lower in status in terms of financial standing, educational attainment, job prospects, job um, role, okay, the non-rapists. Okay? That would give some boost to this argument, okay, that it's partly um, due to um, having kind of low status, low, um, low chances, okay, of um, getting a mate through other means. Um, maybe also giving some evidence to this argument is the fact that young female victims, young adult female victims, are the ones who are most likely to be psychologically traumatized by rape. Now, obviously anyone can be psychologically traumatized, okay, but statistically speaking, um, young female adults are more likely to have long-term psychological issues as a result of rape than older victims and even um, child victims. So the evolutionary argument regarding this would be that it's a kind of learned mechanism, okay, to help protect you from this violent individual in the future, okay, when you're still of reproductive age because you want, you know, someone who's going to help look after um, the offspring. Also giving some credibility to this argument is that when we compare instances of consensual sex and cases of rape, cases of rape are significantly more likely to result in a pregnancy okay, than cases of consensual sex. Um, consenting individuals in a relationship, if they're not using contraception, there's about an average 3% chance okay, that they'll get pregnant. The rates typically range from about 2 to 4 across studies, okay, but the average is about 3%. Across all rape cases, about 6.4% of them result in a pregnancy. Okay? And if we control for contraception, okay, then it's about nearly 8% okay, of cases that result in pregnancy. Now, this is just a comparison of um, statistics, right? We're looking at one group and comparing it to another group. Um, what do you think might be explaining such a difference in percentage? At least, you know, partly explaining. So I'm not really controlling for anything else here, right? All I'm doing is looking at the data for, for, for rapes and then comparing it to the data from consenting couples. Okay. It's not like a true experiment or anything. I'm not controlling multiple variables. Okay, so what do you think might be responsible, at least partly, for some of the... Okay. Any guesses? Um, okay, I mean, this one age. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly it. Um, yeah, this isn't controlling for age, is the main thing. Now, obviously, anyone can be a victim of rape. Okay, there's you know, elderly people who are unfortunately also victims to rape. But statistically, the most common rape victim is a young female, right? Who's kind of at peak of fertility, okay? Who's at that kind of reproductive age. <clears throat> um, so this is because we're not really controlling um, so again, from an evolutionary perspective, okay, that would make sense that this is the individual who's most often the victim of rape, okay, because it's the one that's most likely to help pass on the rapist's genes.
Um, maybe some men um, will rape strangers, okay? Um, some men will rape their wives. In fact, statistics vary quite a lot depending upon kind of operationalization of the question and so on. But the figure is somewhere between 10 to 26% of women, okay, who report having been raped at some point by their husband. Um, and by far the most common motivation behind this is sexual jealousy. Okay. Um, this is also true for cases of husbands killing their wives. The jealousy is the main motivation for men killing their wife in 24% of such cases. Whereas it's about, it's the motive for about 7.7% of cases um, when women kill their husbands. Um, men are also twice as likely as women to be concerned by sexual infidelity, whereas women tend to be more upset by the idea of a emotional betrayal or someone being more emotionally invested in someone else rather than a kind of um, sexual infidelity. This was first found by David Buss at the University of Austin, um, and it's been replicated several times across the states, but also across multiple countries. Okay, and again and again, when you're given the option as a participant, what would be more bothering for you, okay, your partner um, sexually cheating on you, okay, or forming a greater emotional relationship with someone else than with you, okay? And again and again, men are more likely to be bothered by the um, sexual betrayal, and women are more likely to be bothered by the kind of emotional relationship. So from an evolutionary perspective, why do you think that would make sense? Sure, exactly, yeah. So for, for the man, yeah, sexual cheating is obviously a problem because from an evolutionary perspective, because they could then be raising someone else's children, right? They're therefore not helping pass on their own genes, but someone else's genes. Um, for the women, the man is no longer invested in them, maybe therefore not also their offspring, then they might not help care for the offspring, okay? And so they might um, move on to who it is that they've formed a new emotional attachment with. Um, men are also more likely to suspect adultery than women are. Um, and men who rape their spouse most often do so out of sexual jealousy um, rather than any other motivation. And they're more likely to be suspicious over their partners and report higher rates of sexual jealousy than men who don't rape their wives or partners. Now, you know, it may seem pretty obvious, you know, why a man might be upset over his partner having um, had sex with someone else. But, why would the response to that, at least in some men, be to rape their, their wife, to rape their partner, okay, after they find out about the sexual cheating? Um, well, the evolutionary point of view would be that they want to um, pass on their genes, right? There's a window, right, before the sperm fertilizes the egg, and so they want to make sure that their sperm is competing also with the other man's sperm, and they have a good chance of fertilizing the egg and making sure it's their offspring who's born. Not the other man's. <clears throat> yeah. For women, it's fear. It's um, cases of domestic violence in which they kill the husband, get out of it, out of fear, fear of their life. Um, for women, for men killing their wife, this is still the biggest um, motivation, but there's still there's other motivations as well, right? Um, it could be just that the relationship is ending and that they can't deal with it, or that they have they've lost their job, they've had a financial crisis, okay, and so fear of disappointing and that's kind of the you know, main behavior behind a kind of family annihilator 
um, could be a number of things like that, but that's still the main. And this evolutionary lens may also help us explain some kind of general differences, okay, between males and females. First of all, males are more violent on average, right? For every um, female killer, there's nine male killers, okay? So pretty much every crime is more likely to be committed by a man than a woman, okay? Especially violent crimes. And if women do kill, the main reason is out of fear, okay? That they feared for their life, um, and that was the main motivation for why they did what they did. For men, it's more likely to be killing over um, concerns to do with dominance over others, to do with their status, okay, control over others. That's the kind of main motivations for male homicides. Women are more likely to rate provocative encounters as being dangerous. They're more likely to have phobias to do with animals, medical, dental procedures than men are. Okay. They're more likely to go to the doctors, more likely to be concerned over health issues, okay, than men are. Um, but despite all of this, they're not actually lower in stimulation seeking or novelty seeking okay, in, uh, on psychometric instruments. Okay. It's not the case that you know women are less thrill seeking, okay, that they're you know, lo not looking for excitement like men are, yet they're less likely to act recklessly, they're less likely to do dangerous driving than men are. They're less likely to um, be addicted to gambling than men are. Okay, they're less likely to, you know, do a lot of these things that are often an outcome of high sensation seeking or risk taking. Okay, from an evolutionary point of view, that would make sense that women are more protective of their bodies, why they're more concerned over health issues. But they're not just concerned about themselves, but also potentially the offspring that they're carrying as well, right? The survival of the offspring is also dependent upon the survival of the woman. Um, so it makes sense why she might be less you know, willing to risk her health right in certain situations, but it's not the case that they're less novelty or thrill seeking okay, than men are. When we also look at different types of aggression, you know, we see that women are higher in relational aggression okay, rather than physical aggression, right? Relational aggression is name calling. Um, or anything that might, you know, damage someone's um, identity, okay? Um, so, again, from an evolutionary perspective, this might make sense, right? You verbally want to um, make someone seem like less of a desirable mate, for example, to men saying that this person sleeps around, okay? And, again, you know, from the male's perspective, that's not a good future, right? Because if someone sleeps around, then they might not... Be looking after their their offspring, okay. Once there is a pregnancy, it might be someone else's genes. Um, you might argue, well, this is purely because of society factors, cultural factors, and so on. And it's not to say that that doesn't have an impact, but differences in overt aggression between males and females are evident from about seventeen months. Okay, by about seventeen months, males are more likely to bite and kick and hit and hit other children with their toys and so on. Any marker of physical aggression is more common amongst males than females, okay? And we would argue, or the evolutionary point of view would argue, that this is too young an age, okay, to have a difference that's purely a product of environmental or societal influences. That there's some kind of you know, biological basis to aggressive aggression. Now, I'll also... Just to remind you, probably came across this distinction before, but aggression is not one behavioral trait, right? There's mainly two ways of looking at aggression. There is proactive aggression or instrumental aggression. It's more kind of cold-blooded predatory type of aggression, right? It has a goal in mind that one is working towards. Okay? So this could be a child, you know, stealing another child's toys or um, taking their place in line or bullying another child um, or it could be a premeditated homicide or some planned out robbery for example and then there's reactive or defensive 
um, violence, right? In response to provocation, real or perceived provocation, okay, but it's consequence of you know hot blooded passion, okay, in the heat of the moment. Um, so you know, fighting back when one hits you or takes what's yours, um, or time of passion once you know your emotions are high or once you feel provoked. Um, now, both of these are influenced, of course, not just by biological factors. And what's important here is that they're influenced by different biological factors that we're going to go on to look at, okay? That the areas of the brain that are relevant to one are not necessarily re relevant to the other, that there's a difference in the influence from neurotransmitters and hormones on both of these different types of aggression. Um, but of course, they're also influenced by your development and your social experiences. Now, I've, I've laid out here kind of main evolutionary argument, okay, at least for some types of crimes and maybe a kind of general idea of crime. Um, even if this isn't true, and we have to keep in mind that, you know, this is a post hoc explanation, right? It's making sense of something um, once we already have the data, right? It's not something that can be scientifically proven or really tested, okay? It's a, hypothesis. Um, but even if it's not true, it doesn't mean that the other things I'm going to tell you about aren't true, okay? The things about the influence from um, neurotransmitters and hormones and brain structures and brain dysfunction and so on. Okay. This might be what's at the deeper level, okay, of these differences, okay? But even if that's not necessarily true, these other differences are still relevant and something that we can empirically test and measure. Now, obviously, this is with its limitations, right? It obviously doesn't explain all crime. You know, why is it, for example, that murder rates in Japan are a limit of what they are here in the US? Okay. Why is it the murder rates have decreased so massively in 2000 in comparison to 1900? Right? Can evolution explain this? You know, are Japanese individuals so socio biologically different from Americans that it explains this massive difference in murder rates? Or is there going to be differences in culture and differences in environmental factors and so on? You know, are Americans in the year 2000 really so socio biologically different than Americans in the year 1900? Did evolution really explain this difference in homicide rates alone? You know, there's going to be other you know, societal, cultural explanations. It certainly can't explain everything. Is maybe offering us you know, some insight, a piece of the puzzle, okay, when we're trying to make sense of what's driving behavior. Is there anything you want to ask? Is there anything I can clear up? I covered quite a lot there. Maybe to do with what I said, but also maybe more broadly about evolution. Or is it, like, um, most people would say that rape is about dominance. So, um, cognitively, that's true. Okay, that I, I, I need to prove your dominance over someone, to prove your status, okay, to have that control over someone it does seem to be the most common motivation behind rape. Okay. That could be true, and the evolutionary perspective could also be true, right? That maybe they have some rationalization for why they want this status and so on. But at a deeper level, the kind of evolutionary need to have dominance over others and to prove your status and control. I think they could be. Um, anything else? What I'd like you to do in small groups, so maybe two or three, and um, come up together with seven adaptive problems that our ancestors could have recurrently faced and think of ways in which aggression may have solved these problems, okay? And then if there's time, look for a criminal case that can't be explained purely by the individual's environment or by learning theory. Okay. I'll come around and see what you think and then we can 